evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 p.m. and serves as the City's policymaking and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rule of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the Council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the Chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the Council's deliberative process. By City Ordinance, all remarks must be addressed to the City Council as a body and not to any City Council member, including the Mayor. The Chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at SiouxFalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting SiouxFalls.org slash council or by calling the Council Office at 605-367-8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. It's uh, Tuesday, July 3rd, and um, we are in a great holiday week. Uh, hope for a great meeting tonight, and we got the AC on and running. Uh, understand it was a little warm earlier, so hopefully we, uh, we keep it cool in here. So, um, Clerk, I'd ask you to read the roll, and we'll get started. Council Member Selberg? Here. Sale? Here. Starr? Here. Staley? Here. Brecky? Here. Erickson, Kylie. Here. Neitzert. Here. Thank you. Uh, as is tradition with our meetings, we start our uh, city council meetings with an invocation. And, um, and after that, we're going to have a special surprise after our invocation. So um, tonight, it's my honor to have Pastor Austin White here with Celebrate Church. Uh, Austin actually grew up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So he's a long ways from home right now, but he's, uh, Sioux Falls is now home for him. So we're honored to have him here with Celebrate. Um, we'll rise for the invocation. After that, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, and then we'll move into a uh, special surprise after that. Let's talk to God. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. And God, we just ask for your presence here in this place. God, we thank you that out of all of us, God, you love the city of Sioux Falls the most. God, I just thank you for all the council men and women represented here. God, I thank you for their service. I thank you for the hours of labor that they've put in for this city that you love. So God, I pray that you'd be with them during their discussions, during their decision making. And God, bless them and their families tonight. Protect them. God, guard them as they seek to serve this beautiful city. So God, we ask for your blessing. And God, we just thank you that we're able to worship you and be a part of this city in freedom. So God, we love you, we praise you, and we pray this all in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you could just stay standing. Um, Councilor Staley and I talked last week, and she said, you know what would be kind of special to do because it's July 3rd is um, if we could sing a, a God Bless America, which is kind of a neat thing to bring into the council chamber. So um, I believe the words are going to be on the screen. Is that correct? They're, they're up? All right. Uh, and so, uh, Councilor Staley, are we going to sing in unison, or do we have some, 
special uh, no, assignment No, it, it's here. unison. Listen, we want everybody to sing. It, give it, give it your best shot. Yeah. Here we. This is. We, I don't think this has ever been done before. So, it's. We're. I, I threatened to have these council members sing solos. So, <laughs> it, but they they weren't too involved. Okay. So. Uh, <clears throat> God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, wide with foam. No, O Canada, Austin. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, 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 this is our day. Uh, so uh, I now will invite Councillor Starr forward, and we're going to have a presentation of our superhero awards. Thank you. This is. Am I on? Yep. Oh, good. It didn't uh, sound like it as much. I am proud tonight to uh, get to present the two superhero awards um, to two really outstanding individuals. Uh, first, we have Mr. Patrick Kirschman, who's known to his friends as the voting man for his 21 years plus of making sure that those who are physically unable to register to vote or visit their polling place on election day are able to make their voices heard. Patrick has visited these citizens in their homes, hospital rooms, and their care facilities by making first sure that the person's voter's registration is correct. And then with a limited time, he again goes to that person with an absentee ballot request form. He assists with completing the form and returns with a ballot from the county auditor. He repeats this tirelessly effort more than 100 times each election. Through the years, this superhero has helped literally thousands of people compete complete their civic duty, voting. Thank you, Mr. Kirschman. Well, that was my good side. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next is Mr. Nolan here. Nolan, will you come up? And then Amy, will you come too? You nominated him, and I think you should be part of this as well. Nolan Fleming is a 12-year-old and attends Patrick Henry Middle School here in Sioux Falls. Three years ago, Nolan decided to make this city a better place by partnering with Simon Says Give out of Minneapolis to provide birthday parties in a bag for children in need. The bags include cake mix, decorations, party invitations, and two gifts, one gift of need and one gift of want. So far, he has provided over 300 birthday bags for local kids. He has also done school supply drives and meal programs for kids. This superhero reminds us that the future of Sioux Falls is in good hands. Congratulations, Nolan.
Ah, oh, such a great way to kick off the meeting there. Uh, we will move forward now to the um, consent agenda, and I'll first ask if there's any changes to the consent agenda. Councillor Neitzert. Yes, I would like to pull item number 23 from the consent agenda and put it on the regular agenda. It is a, uh, an abatement. Okay. Second. Don't need a second on that, I don't Oops, believe. Um, but good to know you're supportive. <laughs> uh, are there any other changes to the consent agenda? Uh, if not, I'll need a motion to approve it then. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Sale. A roll call vote on that, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That is passed seven to zero. We will now move on to uh, our regular agenda. And I uh, would ask for a motion to uh, approve the regular agenda. Move approval. Second. Mo move to approve by Selberg, seconded by Councillor Kiley. Uh, any discussion on that from the council? If not, a roll call vote on that, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Kiley? Yes. Nightsert. Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. Uh, we'll now move into uh, public input portion of our meeting. And so uh, as a reminder, anyone who wishes to address the council, uh, you can come forward and uh, state your name at the podium, speak to the entirety of the body of the council, uh, and um, uh, we'll welcome our first public inputter forward. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Heather Pastor. Um, this right here is my um, printout. I told you guys last meeting about what happened when my old landlord uh, had assaulted me, assaulted police officers. Uh, there were some slanders made that weren't true about me. Um, it was one thing I want people to understand is my situation is not just about me trying to pursue a civil matter. That's part of it, yes. But um, if you could do the next one, please. On this one right here, this is something that was made up for me from the Department of Labor. It states right up on here how I should be approached because of my anxieties and my abilities. It states up there, it says, what people like, adore about me is musically talented, have a great sense of humor, I love my nieces, how to best support me. Speak to me with respect. My personal space is important to me. I will tell you if I feel uncomfortable. I sometimes talk loudly without knowing my voice carries. Please don't take offense if I'm doing this. What are, what's important to me? James, my fiance, my health, having a safe, stable home, my independence, financially, choices in my personal space. What do I want to do in the future? Well, you can scratch out steady part-time job because I'm getting slandered. So actually, the people from the disability rights is uh, trying to get a hold of the people for records because of slanders, and they're refusing to give it up right now, which is part of discrimination. Possibly visit my family in Bethlehem. You know, I just got to be real honest with you guys. I know you people don't know me, but I'll just share it up to you like this. My mother's deceased. I have it reconciled with my dad since he left me. I don't have much family. That man sitting over there, my fiance is all that I have. And everywhere I go in this state, I have people ridicule me. I have people slander me. I have people physically get physical with me. And I don't understand why Everywhere I go, I, it's getting to the point to where when I'm at, at the motel where we live at, yeah, we live at a motel because there is nowhere else to go. It's even that we're camping out in the car. I was slandered at the missions. I got called a street punk. They kicked me out in the blizzard cold for no reason. You know, they sit back while all these people that are there just to drink and, and, and hang out and go to detox all the time get in my face. So now it's to the point to where him and I are living at a motel. He's working. I can't get work because every time I have worked in the past, I have been physically attacked, 
I have been slandered. I have been chased out of job assessments with people saying, accusing me of stuff and saying, quote, if I don't leave, I will go to jail. Now, you know, I, I don't to understand why it is that it's getting to the point to where right now I'm to the point to when I'm at my home because of the things I've been through, I don't really go too many places anymore unless he is close by. I have my windows cover up in my place. I isolate myself from my home. I keep away from people because every time he leaves me alone, he, I always got to call him and say, hey, this person I know is attacking me. Or, hey, this person at this business is being mean to me right now, and this, they're going to try to come up on me. You know? I'm one person, and I don't have much family. All I have is him and two nieces. And it's like this discrimination thing is everywhere I go. My personal opinion, if people are going to slander me and physically attack me and come at me in a certain way, then maybe somebody should be paying me commissary for them lying. Just like, you know, I don't like when people call me a liar. When I sit back and I watch the city council meetings and I sit back and I see exactly what people are saying and I see what they're saying on Facebook and I confront them on it, they come up and they try to talk down to me and say, you have to agree with me. You have to agree with me. Oh, it was so-and-so that did this, but you, that, that they're in my face. That's not right. I don't have any family, and I live on a fixed income. Everything that comes out of my pockets is out of my fixed income. Me and him is doing what we got to do to keep ourselves from being on the streets. One time, we were sleeping in the car in front of the Bishop Dugley house. It got to the point to where we had to move from the parking lot to the parking lot of Walmart till we got paid to get in the motel because these guys were jumping other people in their vehicles, and I got scared. Thank I was afraid you. Thank they would attack me. Thank you. Sorry, but I'm just, you know. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Hey, James. Hi, Mary. How you guys doing? I'm James Reed, okay? Um, I got... Well, two things. One, one is um, the road. Um, that's by the uh, High V on Tenth. Okay, it's all the way down there. Well, anyway, I mean that's the road is really super bad. I mean my car bottoms out. It, I mean it's got holes and it's just, it's a real bad road. Okay. Well, and the other one is, I call around because I'm trying to help her. Okay. Um, one time I got, went to one of them, just told me, yep, bring it, bring the paper in. The next day when I went to go take the paper in, it's like, oh no, no, no. Okay. It's like, I'm doing what I can do and it's not, and I know, like I told you last time, I know you guys listen to everybody and I know a lot goes on, you know, and with, you can only do so much. It's just like, yeah, I, I've seen the way I've watched people. You know, I've even taken people to cross town to where they had to go. Uh, I even pick up people that need to go to work, you know, and I don't even ask, ask for gas. You know, I don't, because I, I like to see people succeed myself, you know. It's just like the time when I, some girl on Facebook, Facebook me, and she says she needs a ride to get to 24 7, I guess it is. All right. And I'm on E, and she lives like way. I said, okay, I'll be there. Because, you know, I want to see somebody succeed. I didn't ask for nothing. I just said, okay, just be ready when I get there to get you there. Okay? It's, and I've even woken people up off the street, you know, and I've had officers say, thank you. You know, keep the good work up. You know, but there's only so much you guys can do. There's only so much officers can do. There's only so much that everybody can do. I mean, it's like I said, yeah, you got your bad neighbor's hood, but it's, if you don't, like I just what I wanted to say, if you don't like the neighborhood you're in, move. Okay? If you don't like it, move. Because like I said last week, they can't be everywhere. Sorry. Have a good evening. James, thanks. Thanks for giving those people rights. I'm sure they appreciate that. Good evening. Good evening. It's Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. <clears throat> With the 4th of July holiday coming tomorrow, I think a lot of people forget kind of the foundation of 
one of the reasons why our country was founded. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, there's a, there's a lot of things people think Fourth of July is about. But one of the reasons why a lot of people came here is because of religious freedom. They were tired of a king telling them how to, how to pray. And uh, there's all kinds of different religions that came here for that. And um, a lot of people don't understand that religious freedom means that government does not interfere or tell you how to, how to uh, um, worship your God if you do. And it also tells you that you don't have to worship a God. Some people wonder how the invocation got started. And a lot of people don't realize it that the invocation, the beginning of the meetings, was started by a man who wasn't even a Christian or a Muslim or Buddhist or anything. He was a deist. Benjamin Franklin, as I consider one of the greatest founding fathers of our country. During the Continental Congress, Benjamin Franklin suggested that they have an invocation at the beginning because things are getting pretty rowdy. And someone who attended the meeting where Benjamin decided to come up with this idea recorded what he said, and I'll read, read to you what Benjamin Franklin said. Before I sit down, Mr. President, I will suggest another matter, and I am really surprised that it has not been proposed by some other member in an earlier period of our deliberations. I will suggest, Mr. President, that propriety of nominating and appointing before we separate a chaplain to the con this convention, whose duty it shall be to uniformly assemble with us and introduce the business of each day by an address to the creator of the universe and the governor of all nations, beseeching him to preside in our council, enlighten our minds and a portion of, hev of heavenly wisdom, influence our hearts with a love of truth and justice and crown our labors with complete and abundant success. In other words, he wanted everybody to chill out before the meeting started. It had nothing to do with religion. <laughs> now on to something else, and I hope you guys all have a good fourth. We're looking forward to the parade tomorrow. I never miss it. I had a, I had a conversation with uh, County Commissioner Jeff Barth. He called me to tell me that they're going to have an opt-out in the county. And I asked Jeff a, a very simple question. I said, when are the local governments going to start working together? I said, you got to realize something. We want to build a new jail. We want a county opt-out. We want a water treatment plant. We want a police safety village. And we want $190 million of the new schools. If you add this all up with principal and interest, you're looking at well over a half billion dollars within a couple year period of time. So my question to Jeff was, number one, our taxes are gonna go through the roof. But my bigger question is, I don't question the need for all these things. We need them, I know that, I'm not stupid. My question is, why haven't the local governments ever had a discussion about these projects and setting up a timeline of who gets to go first in this timeline and spread this out over four to five years. The jail's been on the docket for a long time. I would say that would be the first project to go. And then coordinate after that. We have a housing problem in this town because people tell me they can't afford to build a house in this town and once you do build it, you can't afford the taxes on it. I think it's time that our local government started sitting down and having real discussions, not donuts and coffee, real discussions about the real needs of our community and about how we're gonna go about that in the most fiscally responsible manner. Not spending a half billion dollars within a two year period of time and going, ah, taxpayers will just pay for it. And trust me, I wasn't this pleasant with Jeff <laughs> on the phone. And he knows that it's time that we do something different. And I'm not gonna discuss the things with the school district. I'm gonna talk to them separately. Thank you. Thanks, Scott.
Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Hi, I'm Katrina Lair McKinney, and I'm president of All Saints Neighborhood Association. All Saints Neighborhood is located directly south of downtown between approximately 14th and 21st Street um, and Minnesota Avenue and 7th Avenue. And I am here today just to let you guys know about something that's happening in the neighborhood and I wanted to give you a heads up about it um, because you'll be hearing more from us as well as uh, other parties involved in the future. Um, Getting back to the, the Neighborhood Association itself, the mission of our Neighborhood Association is to foster a safe, happy, and beautiful neighborhood. And within this context, the work that we do is to advocate for housing availability in our neighborhood. Because frankly, without the housing, no neighborhood would actually exist. Without diverse housing options, our neighborhood vitality is greatly decreased and All Saints Neighborhood is a very diverse neighborhood made up of all kinds of people in all kinds of household incomes and jobs and ethnicities and it's wonderful. On May 23rd, I gave a statement on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Neighborhood Association um, to the Board of Historic Preservation because um, there is a current redevelopment issue happening on the 1000 block of South Dakota Avenue. Our understanding is that uh, the buyer of this property wants to raise several houses, uh, residential houses on the 1000 block of South Dakota as well as the commercial properties that are on the Minnesota Avenue side of that block. And these are the reasons that our neighborhood association feels um, that that would be a detriment to the neighborhood. Number one, housing in All Saints neighborhood is currently in demand. Losing residentially zoned property in our neighborhood will be a detriment to the livability and demand for housing in the central neighborhood. Number two, our association supports housing of all kinds. Rental properties and owner occupied properties are both valued greatly. Housing for diverse household incomes is also valued. With uh, the purpose of this letter is to advocate for housing of all kinds, whether it is single or multifamily. All Saints Neighborhood Association does not support property owners who use neglect as a way to make a self-fulfilling prophecy for de demolition, which is what has happened in this case. Several houses have sat vacant and or in very, very bad shape for a long time. Uh, no money, no investment has gone into those properties and they've been purchased and they're just sitting there, boarded up and neighbors are questioning what's going on. We feel that if these houses are raised because they're in too tough of shape, this will do nothing but further set an example for property owners in other historic districts like ours that choose to instead of take maybe a little more challenging role uh, to do what is easiest and raise properties and build something brand new. Number four, properties adjacent to this block are registered historic. And this is the, the Sherman Historic District that this block is within. Therefore, changing zoning to commercial on this block will have a detrimental effect on the historic des designation. The Sherman Historic District is very, very small, and losing any home in the district will put it at risk for losing historic designation. And number five, as a core neighborhood with defined boundaries, we strongly support the city's current legal zoning map. Commercial encroachment into existing historical core neighborhoods can increase commercial traffic increase vehicle noise, reduce aesthetic, lower residential property values, damage housing stock, challenge uh, historic value, and reduce the overall quality of life of our neighbors. This is why our city created and uses zoning regulations and we support those laws. Is that my time? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I heard a ding. Um, and then just the last comment that I wanted to make is, um, in, in regards to rehabbing versus raising and getting rid of um, historic properties, I don't know how much you guys are familiar with um, whether you rehab something and reuse something that is old or 
tear something down and build something new. But there are lots and lots of studies out there in the world that show the economic value for the community in doing so. And we feel that the economic impact for the community in keeping these houses the way that they are mixed with commercial is overall the best thing to do for the community, not just investors. Katrina, so. thank, thank you. Um, Thanks. And I'm gonna go off script and ask you a question. Have you talked okay. with people in the city in planning about this issue? Uh, yes. You have, okay. Well, um, people in the audience I know that will continue to look into that and those concerns, so thank you for sure. thank you. bringing it up. And your neighborhood association can be lifted up as a one example of a good neighborhood association is, so you guys do a great job. Thank you. So thank you. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening, George Hamilton, All Saints Neighborhood Association. Uh, in 2006, along with my wife, we started purchasing property in the All Saints Historic District. At that time, none of you were on the council. At that time, the neighborhood was in real transition on its way down. Things that slowly started to change in the downtown area and we were trying to make some progress with bringing the downtown area back, so we decided to invest in this neighborhood. We purchased two houses in August of 2006. The day we were at closing, the uh, Sioux Falls police were serving a no-knock warrant and kicking in the doors of the properties that we were purchasing at the title company. Those houses were in bad shape, and I will be sending you pictures uh, to, the, to, to show how the neighborhood has gone and stuff. Uh, maybe a year and a half ago, when Mayor Huther was involved, we had a property at 923 South Dakota Avenue that was one of the self-fulfilling prophecies, and the property was going to be raised. Uh, they stepped in, they brokered a deal between a private owner and a buyer who purchased the property. The owner sold the property at a loss. That property is listed with Haig Properties right now for $259,000. They purchased that property for around $30,000, and they put well over $150,000 into that house. The first two properties we purchased were about $77,000 a piece. We put well over $125,000 into each property. We have several properties in the neighborhood now. Um, I've been awarded um, Landlord of the Year through the Mayor's Program and stuff. Um, this is our neighborhood that we are working on. These houses that uh, Justin Johnson and Assam Properties represent right now can be saved. There's no such thing as a house that can't be saved until it's tore down. This is the 1000 block of South Dakota Avenue. There are three physical structures that are standing on Dakota Avenue, one that is uh, standing on 19th Street behind Gustav's Florals, okay? But that whole section, there are two vacant lots also on that corner next to the antique store right there that uh, next to Keystone Mortgage that you might be familiar with. But this is a residential block. Houses have been torn down, allowed to fall into disrepair and everything. So now somebody has came in and said, now's the time, let's take this property, convert it to commercial. We've got residential stretching from 14th all the way up to 18th. There's that block right there. It continues down to Dakota. There's residential on the sides and everything and stuff. If you allow these properties to be torn down, which would take for you to change the zoning, that's, that's the key part here and stuff, because the historic board has written, already gave their opinion and said no. So this item is gonna come before you. And the only thing that can stop this here from going forward is the rezoning from residential to commercial. Once it's rezoned to commercial, all bets are off. Now, you all have seen what happened in McKinnon Park. You saw with your own eyes how things got out of hand and the final impact was a house being tore down. We're simply coming before you now to plant the seed. We do not want to lose any more houses in our neighborhood. You're familiar what happened with the expansion of Sanford in the neighborhood. 
even though the expansion took forward and things have been compromised and stuff, houses were taken out of the market. You saw what happened with McKinnon as it went south and stuff. But McKinnon was not allowed to go west into the historic district. People stood up and said, stop. They went south towards um, 26th Street and everything. But you hold the power. Not the historic board, not the state. You hold the power. If you rezone it from residential to commercial, then we lose our neighborhood. You know, we're trying to buy houses. We're trying to convert houses into livable, sustainable places that are not just a lipstick on a pig. We put a lot of money into this neighborhood, and we will continue to buy property in this neighborhood, and we sell property back to young people who want to buy houses and everything, but we cannot continue to lose the physical structures in our neighborhood for the sake of massive development. There's development going all over. Avera's going out south, going 26 Marion, Sanford's out north. Downtown is thriving and going, but the neighborhoods that are residential, this is the last stand to hold on to some of the most valuable property for homeowners to be able to enjoy and have a core neighborhood to raise their families. George, thank you. Thank you, man. I appreciate your passion on this topic. Thanks for being here. Good evening. Good evening. Sounds like rezoning is a common issue. <laughs> do have a couple of visuals. Can you state your name, ma'am, for the My name is Janelle Kane. I live at 1808 South Lincoln Avenue. I'm here to discuss the lifescape issue. You've all received a couple of emails from me already on this issue, and I'd like to give you a couple things to think about while you are deliberating on this subject. Now, the feasibility study has not come back yet. It's going to be four to five months until the feasibility study comes back telling us that LifeScape themselves had said they don't know if they're going to move or if they're going to update their facility. They, there are too many unknown ifs in this situation. What they have already done is they've already sold all those houses across the street and decided they're going to put in the parking lot. I've done a little research and I found out that in our neighborhood, the Children's Hospital was open to the public for use in 1952. Now that makes that facility 67 years old. It is convenient in the middle of the city. Doctors like it because it's easy to, to get to. The parents like it because it's easy for drop off and pick up. People like the location. So when the feasibility study comes back, my thought is probably more than not, they're going to want to improve this facility that was once built for four children per room, but they're using them now for one to two children per room, depending on the disability that they have, and they are not fully occupied. Now, what they have done is they want to build the parking lot. They have bought all the streets on, or the, the houses on Elmwood between 26th and 28th Street. We found out Easter Monday, April 2nd, that this was happening as the three homeowners on the back side of that block on Lincoln Avenue. Okay, they put up the for sale signs. They sold all those houses at public auction on, on May 5th. They have to be moved by April or by August 15th. Now, we've moved the vote on this issue to the 17th of this month. I'd like to give you a different option that may work. We can take a little longer with this, find out exactly what we do before we rezone where they're already lifting up those houses, where they're taking out those trees all on the boulevard already. And we can try and work something out in the long run with McKenna Hospital across the street who's taking away the 88 parking spaces. The last council meeting we had, the city person standing up here was asked by one of you council members, is it really going to impact them that bad if they lose the 88 parking spaces and they're not replaced? And the answer was no. So maybe something else can be worked out with, uh, with the VA hospital for the parking, because that contract isn't up until May of next year. In the meantime, if there is something on the interval, I want to propose to you right here what we're looking at. 
we have 16 blocks away, 520 parking spaces that are empty every day during the business day at nine ball, different ball fields at Sherman Park. Now with two trips in the morning and two trips in the afternoon during business hours, they could move their employees in and out with no parking problems whatsoever, working with Parks and Recreation to use those parking lots and those facilities when they're not being used by the ball fields. And those are mainly in the evening. We have a problem with getting people back and forth. That's gonna be a lot cheaper in the long run than replacing and putting in that parking lot. Losing all that housing, they've already cut down those trees, already, that's already set up for houses. Maybe we just work with the VA a little bit more, the Builders Association and the other associations in the state, and put in what they're calling the small houses, the mini houses, and help some of our homeless vets that can afford housing or that are on long-term rehab get in and out of those houses so they're close to the VA, so they have dignity, so we can set them up with shorter-term shorter, shorter -term leases than finding accommodable housing for them with no steps here in Sioux Falls. Now, I had a couple other things that I was gonna discuss with you here tonight. However, since my email to you, um, if you wanna change that out, I have had um, Janelle, we're, we're at five minutes, so I'll have to, we'll have to continue okay. our discussion okay. um, with the, your counselor offline or with a member of the city staff. Um, okay, will thank do. You. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else for public input? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening. Hi, I'm Jim Johnson. Uh, Jim. I manage a business up on North Cliff Avenue. Uh, about two months ago, I was on vacation, come back and go to my office and there's a letter from the city saying, uh, hey, your dumpster needs to be in an enclosure. If it's not done within a certain amount of time, $100 fine. I was like, holy cow, I better get this done. Got on the phone with waste management, said, hey, uh, I'm gonna need two smaller dumpsters, one for my recycling, one for our regular trash. Um, can you get this done for me? And they were like, yeah, sure, we can, we can get that done. I go, cool. So I call the city up and I say, hey, I got this handled. They're, they're gonna get it taken care of. And I let it go. About a week later, I get a phone call from the city saying, hey, it's still not done. I said, oh man, let me get on the phone with waste management again. Called them up, said, hey, city's crawling up. Many of you, you know what? Uh, to get this done, they go, oh, I'm sorry, we dropped the ball, you know, we'll get it taken care of. A couple of days have passed, still nothing, get another call from the city, so I call waste management again, they apologize. On the 7th of June, they got it done, about four in the afternoon. Well, apparently about 10, I think, in the morning, city guy came, took the picture, said it wasn't done, fined me a hundred bucks. Well. Some people say I'm a little abrasive. I, <laughs> I get a little upset. As you can see, all those are city or county properties. All their dumpsters are hanging out. I've been calling the city on a regular basis saying, hey, are you guys gonna take care of these problems? And they keep brushing me off. And once I get something in me, I don't let go. I've made it a mission of mine to go around to all the city properties now just to take pictures of their dumpsters to make sure that they're getting taken care of. And the guy told me that, you know, hey, thanks for doing this, uh, but you know, we're doing what we can to get it done. I says, hey, I was doing what I could to get it done. I could only do so much. I can't go out there and physically pick up this big dumpster and put it in my, my area. I got, I got to wait for these guys to do it. So just the other day, I got a, I was sitting in my van eating lunch and all of a sudden I see this white city car pull into my parking lot. Guy gets out and he starts walking around the property and I get on and I go, hey, what do you, what, something I can do for you? He goes, oh yeah, we're just checking your buffer zone. I don't know what the hell a buffer zone is. And I go, so what, just because I'm complaining to the city now, you guys are going to start harassing me over every little thing now? Oh no, no, everything's good, everything's good. So then I started making phone calls to some city council. I did get, get a hold of one and 
she's the one that told me to come down here and state my case to you guys. But every one of those pictures I drove around today, they're all still there. And it's a month now. So I'm kind of waiting for my $100 check for every one of those. <laughs> you know, that's, that's still not done. And I'm gonna keep driving around until it does get done. And I might come back, this is the first time I've ever been in there. This place is pretty cool. So, <laughs> yeah, that's really all I got to say. Well, come back anytime, and I apologize if you feel harassed, because it's certainly not the intent. So we'll, we'll look into this as, w as well. Jim, thanks cool. for coming and seeing your case. Thanks. Anyone else? Sierra Broussard, Sioux Falls. Hi, Sierra. So as I, t uh, I uh, was texting council on these massage parlors here, we have people from the southeast, northeast, and northwest, very rich people, middle class and poor, complaining about these massage therapists. I know for a fact that these are not being under investigation. So I'm going to go in there, and when we see violations, we would just put it up on Facebook, and maybe the police will do something and bust these massage therapists from doing illegal activity. So starting tomorrow, I will be in there. <clears throat> I'm gonna have a fight on my hands with Chief Burns because he's gonna say they're being investigated, but I know from inside source that they're not being investigated at all on those issues. Now, since the city doesn't like as public inputters to start mess within city government and the police department, because the police department got to do their job because I pushed the issue. There's many of times where I have got into with the policemen that we were fixing a box on street corners because they don't do their job in high crime area neighborhoods. As I stated, I'm still doing that petition drive to get Chief Burns out of here. And one of the reasons is Can you this. please not address Chief Burns by name, please? Um, and, I, and one of them is because of City Hall, too. So I'm, I'm going to tell you how our government works with community activists, OK? I had city citizens send an email to the mayor and to um, the police chief, and they got vague responses back. So here we go here. So when you, when, you dial, when you dial numbers to reach the police department, you're blocked. This is what you get. When you call the mayor's office, you get blocked. But I'm so smarter than IT, I can get around the system. When you call community health, you're blocked. When you call the health department, code enforcement, you're blocked. When you call the non-emergency, you're blocked. This is one reason why I'm doing a petition drive against Chief, because I don't think the mayor is going to get Chief out of here. So I've been going around to the rich side of town. I've been on the southeast side of town and the northeast and the northwest to put this petition together. I've been arguing with law enforcement for two weeks now because of all the drug trafficking, prostitution, and pimping that is not getting done. I have requested these business owners to contact the, mayor, the mayor's office. They had sent the mayor a letter. The mayor has uh, Julie has brought them to the police department. The police department sent out a vague later, letter saying that we are working for public safety and that not everything that makes the, uh, makes the, the media comes to the new spotlight. When they do their briefings and when we have drug busts or we have human trafficking, prostitution and pimping and the media is on these news briefings, it will come out to the news media. So uh, Chief uh, Galen Smith uh, here has put his foot a little bit deeper in, in, into this uh, situation. Now, uh, Mayor, we have the Northeast rich people, middle class and low class people, high end people, 
has sat there and emailed you about this unprofessionally of this policeman, the police not doing their jobs, jobs and the human trafficking and prostitution stuff that is going on. Those were forwarded to the chief of police and Galen Smith, nothing is getting done about, about this at all. Nothing is getting done about it. And believe me, I have my resources to dig into the police to make sure nothing's getting done. And as of right now, I'm not going to open up my mouth how I know, but these issues are not getting done and addressed properly on those issues. So if you would read your emails from your uh, citizens here with concerns on the southeast side of town, the northeast and the northwest with this human trafficking and people going into church parking lots and wanting hand jobs or hand gestures for $20 on Sundays, that's, that, that, that's out of control here. Okay? And it's coming from the north side of yeah, town. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Nancy Hansen. I have a couple of things that I wanted to bring to the, the council table this evening in the chambers. First of all, I was here to check to see just how tightly the five minutes in public input session goes, and it's a very big challenge and I, pay, I really appreciate your patience with it all and there are folks that need to be heard and it might be a challenge when the three minutes comes up of you being able to say thank you, okay. your three minutes is up. Okay. So I understand that there may be a chance that the timing device will be of big help to you. And I'm very encouraged that you're considering this as part of the package of the electronic evaluation that's going to happen in the very near future. I also am impressed with the fact that folks do get to give their input and nobody got boisterous, nobody was swearing at you. And so that's an encouragement to me that they really are serious about being heard. I appreciate also that you direct to the folks a place that will be resources for them to get answers to their problems. Okay, that's, that's my first little ditty. And I wanted also to encourage you to pursue further the idea of the Fort Worth Homeless Program and bring it to an agenda item for discussion at the table because I think it has a lot of value in our community. I know that the homelessness is a problem in our community and I hope that by doing a valuable build their confidence in themselves can make that a possibility for improvement. Happy Fourth of July. Thank you for the work that you do. Nancy, it's a pleasure emailing with you as well this week. All right. Seeing no more public input, uh, next item. Well, there is one more. Oh, Brett, come on up, man. Sorry. <laughs> How are you, man? Good. Good. Uh, Brett Cruz, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, um, I was listening to these people, I was like, it's pretty good. Like, I mean, I don't know. If you're actually going to do anything, ball, because he goes in one ear and out the other. I don't know. I swear. But maybe the counselors can force him to do stuff, you know. I'll vote him. Yeah. And uh, and with the uh, lifescape, it's pretty good. And then oh, we we're building a new building or whatever. All right. Um. Oh, one thing. LeBron sucks. Goodbye. <laughs> Any other public input? Thanks, Brett. Uh, if not, uh, next item, please. Next item is item 23. It's an abatement, David Holiday, 4212 South Alpine Avenue, abatement number 2018-0091. 
for parcel ID number 86941 for 2017 property taxes in the amount of $1,462.93. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Neitzer. I, I do have a statement to make uh, regarding this, but I was told that the applicant that did apply for the owner-occupied status may be here tonight. If, if it would be um, okay with you, I'd like to see if that person is here and give them a chance to at least tell us why they missed the deadline. I think that would be only fair before we vote on it. If Don't Mr. Holiday is, is Mr. here. Mr. Holiday here this evening? He's not here. Apparently not. Okay. So I, I just want to make sure I gave him the opportunity yep, just in case. That. Okay. 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 So uh, hey, with that. Excuse me. Just a question, was the applicant notified that we were going to be doing this? Because I know the last time we had this, mm -hmm. I saw the people at the county after the fact, and they, were, they did not know that this was, we were having this meeting at this time. We, we, very good Councilor question. Knight, we, did have a, we did have an email from uh, attorney, Assistant Attorney Ryan Sage confirming that he was contacted, and I also had a discussion by phone with Attorney Sage, and he repeated that fact that they, were, they made sure to notify him. Okay, so I'm thank taking you. Him at his word on that one. Um, so I, the reason I pulled this is I just wanted to say that um, SDCL 10-13-40 states the application for owner-occupied status uh, must be submitted by March 15th. It says shall. The only exception is in 10-13-40 sub 4, which grants an exception for active duty military personnel. There's no other exception uh, in the, in the uh, SDCL for that. Uh, based on that, I don't believe that we can legally grant an abatement. And so therefore, I'm going to make a motion to re recommend denial of Mr. Holliday's request number 2018-0091 to the Minnehaha County Commission. Do I have a second for second. that? Okay, motion by Councillor Neitzer to uh, recommend denial, seconded by Councillor Kiley. Further discussion on this issue? Council, I could Council Mr. Star. Mayor. Just to point out the way this process works, I think for most people, the one thing that we do do is that statute, as Councilor Neitzer says, doesn't allow us to offer um, the exemption. But what state law does allow us to do, or to recommend to the county commission, is Mr. Uh, Holiday's request for an abatement. I'm not ready to, to maybe jump in on his side quite yet, but we're not doing anything wrong by allowing the abatement. What has happened in the past has been the history of why you didn't apply. I wasn't here, I didn't get around to it, I've done it in the past, I forgot. Um, what this does by having it on our agenda is to get a chance to hear from the applicant. And for me, him not being here is, is one of those opportunities that he's missed and it, it makes it harder for me to to at least hear his side of the story. So to say that we don't have an opportunity to offer this abatement to him, um, an abatement is just the process of forgiving the tax. It's not granting the, uh, the exemption of owner occupied. Um, I sure would have been a lot more on his side and had the opportunity if he would have, would have been here this evening. But again, this is a recommendation that we're making to the county commission one way or the other. They basically have the final say as well. So. I'll probably end up voting against it because I don't have a good reason why he didn't apply on time. So, more FYI. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion on the council on this? If not, I'll call for a roll call vote on this motion. Council Member Selberg. So a yes is against the abatement. Make sure I'm on straight. A yes. Yes is to, to deny. Deny, right. I said yes. Did he say, okay. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Knightsert? Yes. Of that, motion passes seven to zero. Uh, we'll now move to um, the unfinished business portion of our agenda, and I would invite Jamie. Um, I'll read the items into the record. The items? Okay. okay. Good. Perfect. Item 33 is a new 2018-19 retail malt beverage license requesting off-sale use only. For Aldi Incorporated, Aldi number 22, 600 West 85th Street, CUP not required. Item 34 is a new 2018 retail wine license requesting off sale use only for Aldi Incorporated, Aldi number 22, 600 West 85th Street, CUP not required. Item 35 is a transfer of a 2018 retail liquor license from Bistros and Moore Incorporated, Old Chicago 
4301 West 41st Street to Smokehouse Partners Incorporated, Cody Smokehouse, 6401 South Louise Avenue, CUP not required. Item 36 is a new 2018-19 retail malt beverage license for the Hideout LLC, the Hideout 1, 1213 North Cliff Avenue, CUP not required. Item 37 is a new 2018 retail wine license for the Hideout LLC, the Hideout 1213 North Cliff Avenue, CUP not required. Item 38 is a special one-day malt beverage licenses for Panacea Brewing Company to be operated at the 8th and Railroad Shopping Center parking lot, 401 East 8th Street for special events on July 20th and September 28th to 29, 2018. Item 39 is a special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for the Catholic Diocese of Sioux Falls Vocations Office to be operated at 3201 South Kiwanis Avenue for a fundraiser on July 21st, 2018. Item 40 is a special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Stockyards Egg Experience, Stockyards Egg Experience Barn, 301 East Falls Park Drive for special event on July 25th, 2018. Item 41 is a special one-day liquor license for the Zoological Society, Society of Sioux Falls to be operated at the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum, 805 South Kiwanis Avenue for a fundraiser on August 2nd, 2018. Item 42 is a special one-day liquor license for PAVE LLC to be operated at the 8th and Railroad Shopping Center parking lot, 401 East 8th Street, for an outdoor concert on August 25th, 2018. Item 43 is a special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Sioux Falls Sister Cities to be operated at Avera IT parking lot, 230 South Phillips Avenue, Faywick Park, 212 East 11th Street, and on South 2nd Avenue between East 10th Street and South 3rd Avenue, for German Fest on September 8th, 2018. Item 44 is a special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Catering America to be operated at 3708 Bertina Circle for a donor special on September 13th, 2018. Thank you. Jamie, now you're on. Jamie Palmer with licensing. Um, all of these items are, are um, pretty standard requests. If I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. All the special one days have met their publication requirements and and are before you tonight. Uh, does the council have any questions for Jamie on any of these? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. Jamie, remind me about the special one days. Most of these all hire I, you know, there's one that uh, is paved. They have a license, obviously, for alcohol and serving. Do do people normally set up and buy the alcohol themselves and, and sell it to their guests at these special events, or do they normally have some kind of service that comes in and does that for them? I guess I'm concerned about, because I don't think we do any enforcement, or I, d I don't like using the word sting, but we don't, you know, because they fall outside of that, and we approve a lot of one-day licenses um, over and over again, and I guess I'm just, I'm interested in the enforcement part of it for underage and how do they get the training that they need that a, a, a business that we gave a license to would, would do that part of it. Well, ironically enough, the applicant for that PAVE um, request is actually here, so I might just let him speak to that himself. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. I didn't mean to grab that one in particular, but you get to, okay. thank you for You're being okay. here. Uh, my name is John Geiken. I am a owner and operator of PAVE. Um, so in this instance, we, we actually do the carding of all the people that are looking for beverages that evening. Um, we bring in PAVE employees to help do the setup. Um, we bring out portable bars that we made. Um, we obviously work pretty hand in hand with our vendors that there, there's strict guidelines as far as when the liquor can be delivered, has to be picked up that day. And we're, we're very professional about it. And we're very like trying to hold up to what the city asks us to do, because we understand that this is more of a privilege, not something that's deserved. Um, so in this instance, it's a uh, soul crate, the local uh, group that's been around for 15, 16 years. It's a uh, it's actually their last concert, and uh, just I know them personally, and uh, we actually, as a part of that, we donate all of our proceeds to them for the cost of the event. We actually don't make money on it. Uh, we just cover our costs, and we call it good. But uh, as far as... That you provide for other... I've only, I've only ever done it for uh, the Soul Crate group. 
uh, Wes Eisenhower and Corey Gerlach and those guys. And uh, I did it for Bump Underground Block Party last year for uh, Jason Weiss. Um, otherwise, no, it's not something that I, I would want to make common. It's a very tedious process. Uh, it takes numerous hours to do, a lot of uh, power to extra staffing to get in there and help out. And we like to see it because we're very passionate about downtown being a place to go. Uh, obviously, that does benefit my business as well. But I like the idea that we can bring more people downtown and offer events such as this, where it's an outdoor concert, where people can hear live music, they can mingle with other friends and family. There's food trucks where they can have food. Uh, we bring our staff out there that, that does ID the people. Uh, people get a wristband and a stamp. Uh, that's when they're able to purchase a drink ticket from us. And then the drink ticket is used to purchase the actual drink. Uh, I know that Soul Crate actually hires another company that monitors. It's the same company that runs the Premier Center for concerts. So they do have security there that's constantly walking, looking for the wristbands, looking for any kind of possible issues or problems or if people are intoxicated or maybe shouldn't be there those kind of things. So we, we, we all work together as far as just making sure that we're upholding the best, you know, to our abilities. So perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, I guess absolutely. my overall statement for this, I, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you anymore. So I'm, I'm good. Oh, that's so, okay. Yeah. Um, my overall statement is I prefer to, to approve these for that type of situation as much as I do someone who sets up a private bar and decides to, to be in the alcohol business for, a one day or multiple days or there's a lot of these that we approve that we don't know exactly what's going on but I'm hoping that most of these are hiring a group like PAVE to to do the professional end of handling the alcohol sales. And I will add um, all of these items or the notice or the memo is also set sent directly to the police chief and so he is aware of, of these, these uh, special events going on you know so if they you know, they're aware of them anyway, that if they need to. And I will share with you too that a lot of these items are not on public property, but specifically for um, um, the requests that are on public property, they go through, they also go through what's called the Special Events Committee. And we do review, you know, pretty extensively their safety plan, you know, their their boundary that they are licensed and and we encourage them to make that boundary actually a little smaller for their alcohol so that in case somebody does wander off, that they're still okay um, and they don't get in trouble. Um, so there are, are things that we kind of walk through them a little bit before um, or when they make their request, so. Perfect, thank you. Other questions for Jamie? If not, is there anyone else from the public that wants to speak on any of these issues? Okay, if, if not, I would ask for a motion to approve items 33 through 44. So moved, Star. Second, Neitzer. Moved by Councilor Star, seconded by Councilor Neitzer. Any further discussion? If not, uh, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Star? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 45, please. Item 45 is a second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Chapter 30, City Council, Subchapter, Organization and Procedure, Section 30.015, addressing the Council time limit. Um, I don't know if there's any councillors that are going to address this issue specifically. We had no new information provided this week. Um, I will first ask councillors to speak to it and then we'll take any public input on this. Councillor Staley. I, I did have an amendment to make. When would I be? Should I put that uh, in now? Let's, we'll, we want... we'll first invite public input on that and then um, ask for an amendment. Okay. So is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this topic? Hi, Scott. Hello. Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. <clears throat> I did listen to the informational meeting earlier, and, and um, uh, Teresa is, I hope you guys support her amendment. 
I think that it's important that we still have the use of the overhead to show pictures and stuff because, you know, the directors and other city employees come up here all night long and use that visual material, the equipment here all night long. So I don't see why that's a problem with the public. Um, I also don't have any issues with some of the other things that were changed, the three minutes, the time limit. But I will say this. I agree with Councillor Brecky that the process was wrong and that's not how we should have done it. We had a work session a couple weeks ago. We should have brought this up then. Second thing with that is um, this whole thing does nothing to solve the problem that we saying we need to do this because of the problem of disruption. I've argued all along that half of that problem is gone. There was two people up on this dais, we won't use their names because they're gone, that would antagonize public inputters, they would laugh at them, they would point at them, they would smirk at them, they would make smart aleck remarks at them, they're gone. Half of that problem was solved in itself. So far, Paul has been very respectful of the public inputters and he's handled situations when they've arised. And that's what a chair does. They handle the situations when they arise. The other thing you have to realize is there was a very important Supreme Court case last week decided. <clears throat> it was about Mr. Lozman. This is actually a second Supreme Court case. He's won against the city of Riviera, probably saying the name of the wrong in Florida. He won a case in 2013 where they said his house boat was a boat and it wasn't a boat, it was a floating house and he won. Well, he just won another Supreme Court case and it had to do with public input. He was arrested at a meeting and if you watch the, the, the thing, he did not come after the police officer because the police officer did what he was told to do. He went after the city because they arrested him for public input. He didn't re resist the arrest either. He, he, he took handcuffs and went out. What they said was he was not being germane to city business. The Supreme Court kind of, if you listen to the hearing, they kind of said, well, he, he was talking about the county and the, and the city lies in the county. So he was being germane. But what I want to say about all this is that <clears throat> the First Amendment and our right to speak to our public officials is one of the greatest rights we have as citizens. I hear people go on and on about guns and Second Amendment and property rights and all the stuff our veterans have done for us and this and that and everything else everybody talks about. The First Amendment is the greatest right we have as citizens. I, that's why they made it number one. They made it number one because it gives citizens the right to come and address their government in a public forum. I could send you emails, I could give you calls. That's not a public forum. That's me going out to you and you coming back to me and saying this. There's a reason why we have this and there's a reason why it needs to be first. As I've already brought up, this, we own this government, we should go first. It isn't about a poor or rich argument. It's about the public being first because we own the, we own the, we own the government. That's just plain and simple. Developers, they own them as individuals, but as their businesses, they're here to do business. It's, part, it's a cost of doing business. If I have to stand in line to get a, license, a beer license or something, that's a cost of doing business. That's why the public should go first. We're here on our own time. We pay for this government. We should be first. And like I said, I still have heard no one on this council in the media or anywhere explain to me how they fixed the problem. They didn't. There's all this backwards dealings. There's <laughs> I can't believe some of the stuff I was told. All this stuff was done behind the scenes. Possible some of it could be violations of meeting laws. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. For what? We didn't fix anything. The problem fixed itself. We had a great example tonight. There was a person up here that said a possible offensive word to some people, and Paul cut her off. 
He did the right thing. That's what he's supposed to do. That solves the problem. I feel sorry for you because you guys wasted a lot of time on this for something that was so simple and not broken. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Any other public input on this topic? Yeah, Janelle, welcome back. Hi, Janelle Kane, Sioux Falls. I just want to say this is my first time being in 27 years in front of the city council. It is very intimidating for many people. It is extremely intimidating for the group of people I work with in property management. If they have a disability to come, it's hard to come. And then to think that maybe you're only gonna get three minutes, it's not worth your time to come. It's hard for me four or five minutes because I teach continuing education. So it's either a three hour or eight hour class. I thought I had one more minute left, okay? But it's very, very difficult and intimidating because everybody that comes up here, whether it's about their business, their home, what it is, that's their livelihood, that's where they live, it is important to them, and it involves their actual needs of what they do, how they function, where they live, what their income is, and I think they deserve to be heard for at least five minutes because it's hard to even convince people from our neighborhood that are so upset about this to come down because they're only gonna listen for five minutes and vote the way the planning and zoning did when we went through. All of them voted no anyway and to rezone. So it's very frustrating as public citizens just to feel like we have only five minutes let alone three minutes. You're gonna see even less of a turnout, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thanks, Janelle. Any other input on this topic? So if not, bef before we introduce an amendment, we first need a motion and a second on the, um, uh, the original ordinance. I would need that first, and then Move we can approval. discuss an amendment. Second. Move approval, Selberg, seconded by Kylie. Uh, discussion amongst the council on this. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'll just say a few words. I don't think there's a lot that can be said that hasn't already been said over the past week, because I've said a couple of times one of the, much of the motivation behind the original ordinance was to start a conversation on this topic. It's been hanging out there for a long time. I felt we needed to have it, and I think we've had a pretty, pretty long and uh, extended conversation for the last few weeks, and uh, I'm I guess I'm thankful to everyone when all was said and done and it wasn't pretty and there was a lot of back and forth, but everybody moved a little bit towards each other to come up with this compromise. And I want to thank all the citizens that showed up, all the citizens that reached out, and everybody that took a real interest in this. Everybody, there was never an argument about we shouldn't have public input. It's vital. We need to have it be a part of this council and a part of these meetings. The point was to have a conversation about how it was carried out and how can we maybe sharpen it up a little bit and make it better, and that's what we've done. So I'm, I'm appreciative, again, of everybody for their efforts to, again, compromise. Again, I think that shows some leadership and good government, and I want to thank the mayor and his team for participating and helping to lead on this as well. So. Um, I'm looking forward to kind of moving on, trying out this new program, getting it behind us, and moving on to bigger and better things and doing some things for the citizens from here. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shelberg. Councillor Neitzer. I don't want to belabor this because we've gone on well long enough, but I, I'll just say I, I do take... Um, Scott, Scott does make a couple of very good points, and it's things that I've thought about. I, I do have some ambivalence here because... You know, coming into this, one of my main items and concerns was the decorum and the and the disruption issues. But as a, it, it is such a tough nut to crack. I mean, there's, and even even where there was some admonishment tonight, I I could just about guarantee it wouldn't hold up in in court if somebody challenged it. Um, as far as, but it it does it really does come down to I do take the point. It does come down to a lot of how a chair runs a meeting and in in the way in which citizens are treated and that and that you know they feel like they're heard and there there's there's a lot of that and there I think a lot of that frustration was boiling over over the last few years everybody's an adult and responsible for their own behavior so I'm not going to completely throw it on one side or the other but um, it 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 does have a lot to do with kind of you know it, the magic is really at the at, at the chair so um, in any event um, I, this this nibbles around the margins, maybe, as far as uh, addressing the issues I was concerned about, and um, hopefully we can come to something and move on. 
Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Neitzer. Councilor Steely. Uh, well, I'm going to make, I wanted to make an amendment in the spirit of uh, compromise and collaboration. And uh, this amendment is, is formalizing what has already been discussed. But so I'm, I'm going to make a, a motion that um, item E, electronic presentations that this be changed. Electronic presentations that require audio and or visual equipment shall not be allowed. And then adding this provision shall not be construed to restrict electronic or hard copy photos from being presented by the public during a regular meeting. Okay. So I've made that motion. A motion made by Councillor Staley with that amendment. Um, do we have a second on that? I'll second the motion. Seconded by Councillor Brecky. Um, discussion on that. Councillor Neitzer. Only as a matter of clarification, so I understand. So what it would allow is somebody could put a, uh, bring in a, some pictures and put it on the overhead, but they could also maybe bring in a memory stick that had some pictures and a staff could put it in and they could pull them up on the computer. Is that what you're no, kind of no, going for? Well, no, I was talking and actually, well, I was going to say something too, but Jim David, I was going to ask him to make a few comments. Um, in the past, I've had citizens contact me and sometimes they're, they're elderly, senior citizens, who might have been able to take a photo of something, but they don't have, uh, they can't email it out. So they would text it to me and, uh, and they want to come in and address this. So I would forward those photos to Jim David and he'd get them lined up for them. And I have an example here. Do you want to put that on? Yeah. Yes, uh, th this was an, an older gentleman who had a driveway issue, just to show you. I mean, it's, it's pretty innocent here, but he... Um, Yeah, and he, he, so he had two photos that he, that he, I, he, they emailed me. I, he didn't even do it. He had someone else do it. So then he came in to talk and we put them on the screen. Um, so, Jim, would you just, I mean, how much of a hassle is that? Or, I mean, is that a, a big imposition if I send that to your son, citizen? No, well, Jim David, operations manager. I think the intent of the, of the amendment is, you know, the, the, the stick has some, possible issues with it because you have to evaluate it. Does it have virus? Does it have malware? Um, whereas I think if it's what has happened in the past is that an email has come uh, to a council member, maybe it's staff, and then we can actually put it on the computer and, and evaluate it. And uh, that has worked in the past. Okay, so irrespective of the delivery mechanism, all it's about is being able to show an electronic photo versus putting a, having to print one and put it on exactly, the overhead. Exactly, that's right. Okay, uh, no problem with that. Um, it, this might be a question for, maybe it's for the city attorney. I'll just say it and then and we'll see. Could, could the verbiage be put back up of the entire, of the amendment? And so actually reading the entire part E, electronic presentations that require audio and or visual equipment shall not be allowed. That, is that only going to disallow like like a PowerPoint on the computer or I mean what about this is 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 this vision thing here that Jim's sitting by is that visual it wouldn't preclude them from putting a because an attorney might come in with a sheet of paper and say I need to show this legal document and they use the overhead a lot that's not going to preclude that would it no this is this is addressing and PowerPoint presentations, as you have stated, but also videos, commercials, uh, things of that nature. It's, it's if it's a static item, if it is a picture, if it is an electronic picture, it's not moving. It is placed on that or it's placed on, on the computer. If you look at the language here, it says require audio or visual equipment shall not be allowed. But then you have the qualifier, which is the final sentence that clarifies that it can be an item that is electronic or a hard copy. Well, this is electronic the, or hard copy photo, so I just want to make sure that we're not doing something where they can't even put a sheet of paper on the overhead. That's all I'm asking. No, I, so. I, there's nothing in here that would prohibit it. I think Councillor Staley just wanted to make sure that photographs would be allowed on the dot cam. Okay. And, 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 and okay, I'm okay. sorry, go ahead. Well, And can I just say something? I, I had a lot. I have the floor. I just, just addressing this since it's my amendment. but. I'm going to disagree with Mr. Ayersman when, when he just said that we were, had wasted all this time on this public input issue because, to me, it wasn't a waste of time at all. 
I would have been happy to spend months talking about this because I'm very committed to this. And, and let me say that I, Councillor Selberg, I am grateful that you were willing to compromise on this. I, I'm so grateful for our citizens that they're going to be able to continue to speak at the beginning of the meeting. And it's going to be the best experience for them, for our, our wonderful people. And uh, I, I, I'm also grateful that we're going to be able to have input at the first reading because again it gives people that opportunity to speak to us to be uh, to have an accountable uh, historically recorded dialogue so to speak with with their council members it, it gives it authenticity when we we hear from people um, we we had conversations in the midst of this compromise that I was told that photos would be allowed. Initially, they weren't gonna allow photos. I pushed, and we spent a day exchanging heated emails and texts and phone messages. And I said, why can't we have a, a citizen show a photo or two? I mean, that, to me, if, if that helps them to, to help us understand their problem, why not? We have photos from our staff members constantly. They get to get up and give drafts and photos and everything. And why can't we allow our citizens to have the same thing? Um, we, we're a, a nation and a city of technology. We have many different ways of getting photos to our staff members and, and to, to the, the city council. So hard copy, uh, electronic. I just wanted to have that documented here. And, and to me, the way the first it said, electronic presentations that require audio and or visual, visual equipment shall not be allowed. I, to me, it just didn't give the sense that photos would be. I, I was told that that was gonna be in there. So that's why I'm hoping that we can pass this. And again, I, I'm very grateful that we're still gonna be able to hear from our people at the beginning, even though you know it's a little bit abbreviated in the time. Thank you, Councilor Staley. Other, uh, Councilor Neitzer. I just wanna make one other clarification since I made the, I referenced PowerPoint. I, it, you know, this was a large compromise. I frankly don't, I have no problem. I don't care about if somebody wants to show a PowerPoint. I've used it very effectively years ago myself. So if, if it becomes, if it's too um, constricting, I certainly would be willing to revisit that. And frankly, any other piece, because obviously sometimes there's unintended consequences. So um, I, I don't want to leave the impression that I had some issue with PowerPoints myself. I don't, I'm here nor there on that one. So thank you. Thanks, Counselor. Other discussion amongst the council on that amendment? So I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote on the amendment, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Selberg? Didn't. Brecky? Yes. Yeah, you asked me first. He yeah. got put on this list twice, so he, oh, he voted I'll vote first. Oh, yes, I'm twice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Vote only counts one time. <laughs> one time, man. Councilmember Brecky? Yeah. Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That passed 7 0. See, we can have fun here. 7 0, that <laughs> passes. Uh, so, with that amendment passing, uh, uh, we now uh, will need a roll call vote on the uh, amended main motion. Um, assuming there's no other discussion on that. Yes, Councilor Steele. And, and let me say to the public, too, and I, I mentioned this to, to our mayor. and. If I, I just have to say this to you, I'm so appreciative of your openness to communicate. This this man has spoken more to me in the last month than I, I got spoken to in two years. So I, I'm so grateful for that. I want to say that publicly. But also I had mentioned to him in, in as we're moving to this three minute thing, and I want the public to, I'll be saying this over and over again, but it's going to be a different ball game now for people coming in because we had that five minute I used it myself many years, you know, five minutes. Now it's three minutes. So I think as we move into this, in, in a, it's implemented in 20 days, that I'd like something to be said at the beginning of the meeting to say to people, hey, you have three minutes, and limiting it to 10 people. So if you want to speak, you know, maybe get in line, or we have to have some way of rounding people up because sometimes people will lag back and jump up at the end, and I'd sure hate to have you be number 11, and that's gonna be an interesting scenario if that does happen. So, anyway, just wanted to put that in that I hope we can right. say that, have that part of our public input introduction. Thank you, thank you for that feedback too, I appreciate that. 
Councillor Brecky. Yeah, before we vote, I would just like to, you know, to say to the public and the at home listening audience that I really appreciated all of the emails, all of the texts, all of the voicemails that I got. I listened to them all, I read them all. I didn't respond to them all. I'm still overwhelmed by all the information that one receives as a council member at large. And, but I did, I did read them all and I got you know, pros and cons and I found it extremely helpful as you work through an issue like this. I just think having the public involved is so important. It's the final piece of the puzzle and it's the most important part of the function that this council has, I think, is listening to the public and putting that final piece together and finding that balance, which I think we eventually did. There may be some more tweaks to this down the road, but I think this is a good starting point. So I wanna thank everybody and I do intend to vote yes. Thank you, Councilor Brecky. Any other discussion amongst the council on this? If not, I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote on the main motion as amended. Council Member Selberg. Yes. Sale. Yes. Star. Yes. Staley. Yes. Brecky. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Nightsert. Yes. That is passed seven to zero. Uh, next item, please. Next item is 46, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at the northwest corner of West 12th Street and South Ellis Road from the POPUD Pedestrian Oriented Plan Unit Development District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District, petition number 8447-2018 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Hi, Jason. Good evening, uh, Jason Bieber representing Planning and Building Services. Uh, the applicant and owner of this application is Steve Van Buskirk. Uh, it is located at the northwest corner of West 12th Street and South Ellis Road. Uh, it's just under 12 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking to construct some uh, roughly 36 villa type single family homes uh, at this northwest corner of the property. Thanks, Jason. Is there uh, any questions for Jason while we have him here? Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this topic? Welcome, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Jim Sokup, 8900 West Lakeside Drive, Sioux Falls. So um, I do own the property here. Steve Van Buskirk represents me um, for selling lots. Basically what we have here is a development we started five years ago. Um, we had originally zoned this commercial and the demand for commercial, we've had zero offers um, in the last five years on this corner. Um, <clears throat> we had very few inquiries. Um, as you can see, if you've been out there, the residential has gone strong. It's gone really well for us out there. So we'd like to expand it. One of the things we understand, we're at a intersection of 12th and Ellis Road. Um, we've created these lots extra deep and that will help for a buffer zone. Um, we also have other homes backing up to 12th Street, uh, a little bit further to the west. Uh, they have sold without any issue. Um, they've basically were sold out all the way along 12th Street on all these lots. So uh, the piece is a little unique from the standpoint of, I know there was some concern about residential on the corner here. I will tell you, um, commercial follows residential and I really feel the reason why we have not had the demand for commercial is we just don't have enough rooftops out here, especially going to the north. And if you look at it going to the north, you fall into the Skunk Creek area along with Cherry Creek. That's a lot of floodway, a lot of flood plain. Um, the opportunity for expansion for the city to the north, I think is extremely limited. So that obviously limits the ability for the commercial on here. The other item I would say is right now, uh, there's a large demand for residential lots on the west side of Sioux Falls. Right now, there's not a lot of, excuse me, there's gonna be a long time before we get sewer out there. So there's not many single family lots that can be built in that in, on the west side of Sioux Falls right now. So in essence, uh, there again, the commercial will really lag behind until we can get more rooftops out there, until we can get more sewer out there. So that's kind of why we've moved to this direction. Um, we feel, we know we already have the lot sold if we uh, can get this passed. Open for questions. Great additional information. Councilor Steele, you have questions for Jim? Hey, I got a question. Um, you know, with the Prairie Meadows thing on the west side, is there ever an issue with groundwater out there? 
I mean, what's, what's the water table like in your addition? The lake that's out there is the groundwater elevation. So it's, you can tell by, I mean, we have 175 homes out there that are functioning very well. In fact, you can see my house on the corner. I don't even have a sump pump. And these are gonna be slab on grades. I have a basement and I have never installed a pump, sump pump. So what is slab on grade? You mean there's not no gonna be No basement. Oh, really? And that is because of the water level? or No, and why that's, would, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That is because of the type of home that we want to build out there. It's more of a villa, which means uh, our intention is that the everything outside of the house will be taken care of as part of the homeowners association and probably set up for more of an elderly client that's looking for a home that doesn't want to do outside maintenance. Then again, they also don't like steps. But what's the price point going to be? I believe the price point is going to be three hundred to four hundred and fifty thousand. It should fall very much in line with what we have uh, with the rest of the development. Thank you. Other questions for GM Greg? Yeah, um, I, I think you were CC'd on maybe some emails that I traded between Steve Van Buskirk and myself. Um, and I, I do want to say I did raise uh, some concerns at the first reading, and after a lot of discussion with Steve and also sitting down with planning staff, uh, I, I will support it, although I still have a little bit of reservation just because of the corner it's on. But that is a, it's an amazing development. I, I don't think it's beautiful. I know multiple people that live out there, and I, I don't know that any of us really expected that it would go as quickly as it did and be as... Neither me. You too? Okay. I didn't. I had planned a 10-year project. We're in year five, and we're pretty much sold out. Yeah. And, you know, in, in kind of talking about it, my concern was, again, that as policymakers and also thinking about citizens, you know, you, it might be a field right now, but you worry about if I put this here, am I setting myself up for a fight in a couple of years? If something else gets proposed across the street and then your homeowners are up in arms because there's a three-story apartment, for example, being proposed. And so that's, that's where the concern is that what, what is normally would be a transition, but I understand the market isn't there, and having to look at, looking at the top topology, the development potential north of there is virtually zero. I think you own the property on the northeast corner, correct? Yes, I do. Okay, so you own that. And then on the southwest, uh, the, something could happen there, but it's not... It's not that large, and over on, this, on the southeast, it's a total hodgepodge of county properties, and there's not a lot of, frankly, land, land left. So, and it, point being, I, I, I think the potential is somewhat limited on there. It's already a, a big road, and people probably will mostly have their eyes wide open going in there, knowing kind of what they're getting, and then you're doing the buffering of the extra yard and things like that. So with a little bit of consternation, I, I think... As much as I'd like it to be something else, the market apparently just isn't there. So, And I appreciate that. And originally our intention was something else, but the market's not there, like you say. Yeah, and with all of the existing uses in Family Park, I, there's not necessarily that much room to put in a lot of rooftops necessarily. I don't know that it's, and like you said, you got to have a lot of rooftops for a commercial even wants to be there. And right now I don't see any reason why they would really want to be there and just just to let you know you're at the end of sewerability but we have a program for 21 to 2021 to go out basin 15 out to wall lake which will open up all that land out west amen <laughs> that's <laughs> what i'm going to say about that it's needed out there big time yeah i multiple developers are pounding our door on that so thanks Good. thank you the questions for jim <clears throat> no thank you thanks jim uh can i get a motion to uh approve this so move night sir Second sale. Moved by Nitzer, seconded by sale. Any further discussion on the council? If not, a roll call vote on this, please. Councilmember Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Nitzer? Yes. Uh, that passes 7 to 0. Item 47, please. Item 47 is a second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located north of West 32nd Street and east of South Ellis Road from the LW Live Work District to the CN Conservation District, petition number 8463-2018, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5 to 0. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Ronning Companies. Uh, it's located north of West 32nd Street and east of South Ellis Road. That's roughly two acres in size. 
Uh, the purpose of this rezoning uh, is that currently there's a detention area to the south. Uh, the applicant is looking at just uh, adding this lot uh, to the detention lot to the south. Questions for Jason on this, Council. Councilor Neitzer. Is that existing detention lot owned by the city? Isn't that ours, or is that? I, I think it is, and then I believe this one will be uh, will be either given to us or, or part of that detention pond, so. Okay, yeah, okay, fair enough. Other questions for Jason on this? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this topic? If not, I'd love to entertain a motion to approve this. So moved. Second, Selberg. Moved by Kylie, seconded by Councilor Selberg. Any further discussion, Council? If not, a roll call vote on this, please. Council Member Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That is passed seven to zero. Item 48. Item 48 is a second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located at the northeast corner of West 26th Street and South Ellis Road from the LW Live Work District to the C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District, petition number 8537-2018, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5-0. to zero. Uh, the applicant and owner here is also Ronning Companies. Uh, it's located at the northeast corner of West 26th Street and South Ellis Road, uh, just north, north and east of the new Casey's General Store. It's about 1.4 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking at constructing a future retail development to the north and then a small uh, restaurant uh, development to the east of the uh, Casey's General Store. Questions for Jason on this, Council? If not, anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this issue? Welcome, sir. Chuck Point with Ronning Companies, uh, 4401 East 6th Street. Um, just want to make one correction to what Jason said. The, the plan that is up there right now is a conceptual plan only. Uh, Ronnings don't know exactly what will be built there in the future. These are what, if somebody asks us today, we project would be built. Um, we held a public meeting at the branch library on the west side of town. We had four people uh, from three different households attend. They ask, uh, you know, kind of the normal questions um, that people do. Uh, I don't think anybody really objected to what the application was. Uh, they were curious. Um, I, I honestly think there were more people there that expressed concerns about the potential multifamily to the north, which is now getting smaller than what the increase in the commercial development was. Uh, two of the people that lived directly across the street to the east were there, and we discussed uh, uh, things with them. Uh, excuse me, not directly across the street to the east, uh, one lot away and really living on the next street. The, the right across the street is not developed yet and not sold. Um, uh, there were basically all, no questions at the Planning Commission, uh, and I'm really here to answer any questions that you have, so. Chuck. Any questions for Chuck, Councilor? Yes, if I could ask Councilor Mr. Stark. Point a question. It, it, it's timing, so this isn't necessarily directed at you, but as much as your application. What I'm concerned about is that we start making zoning changes to what it could be conceptually, and then we take away our ability as a group to review the potential in the future. Do you understand what I'm, an example is, is that you're giving us that this will be a commercial development conceptually of, of where we're headed. And what we're doing then is that as long as you meet those zoning requirements, you don't come back before us again. Whereas the neighbors, when you do have a plan for that area versus live work, they would have an ability to come tonight. Right now, conceptually, they don't have a problem with what you're doing. But whatever that is in the future, they may have a problem with all of a sudden there's 
whatever that the neighbors and it, it, you just happen to be stuck here because this is when I'm thinking about it. So I apologize for that part of it. But we're we're making a, a switch to something that we don't know what it's going to be in the future. And that's part of our job as a deliberative body to find out what's best for the community. More of a statement than a, a question. And it doesn't necessarily affect you as much as it does the overall policy of what we're trying to create. Tonight. Yeah. Well, if I may. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's why I'm. I think, value your I think what you're making a comment on is the new zoning uh, ordinance, not what we're doing. And absolutely. I, I, absolutely. I didn't come here and testify for or against the new zoning ordinance a number of years ago. Um, I happen to think maybe it's pretty good in most cases. Uh, I'm still having uh, to struggle to understand, and I've only been doing this 33 years. So, yeah, I think, I think there are some things that it takes some getting used to. But what I hear in the community is, that it's easier to understand than the old zoning ordinance. It makes things clear. But again, you don't like it. I, Not it wasn't my idea. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> and that's why I said it just happens to be where there's a number of these where we come back later. And I don't have a problem necessarily with what you're doing. It's the next owner and the you know the way the neighborhood then that's where our problems start to to come and it just happens to be this is where i've wanted to discuss overall policy not that i'm opposed to what what sure. you're doing and what you're trying to do and i'm probably going to vote for it anyway but it's just sure you know what i'm saying you just happen to be there at the right time thank you for sharing. happy to be here councillor neitzer yeah i i do just want to point out since this is my stomping ground that just to the south of there, so on the bottom of that page, there's a Casey's that's virtually complete at this point, a gas station there. And um, essentially because of the way in which they orient, Casey's was gonna go one direction and they turned it the other direction and so they used up a little more. Anyway, it, all we're adding is just another strip of commercial. It's a commercial corner. There's shenanigans is on the other, kitty corner on the other side and you're looking at commercial on the other corners potentially at some point, so it's, we're adding just another, uh, you know, strip of land. So I, and as far as uh, your point is well taken, but that was the major debate of shape places under the 83 ordinance. You had a lot of conditional uses. So I think something would get rezoned, but then they had to do a conditional use. And then at that point they would have to show the plans, but then you got into all of these arguments where, you know, in one particular case, the neighbors got all kinds of concessions, but then in another case, the developer flew right through without anything. And so, things were all over the place as far as it just was kind of dumb luck of who you ran, you know, whether you ran into a buzzsaw of opposition, whereas with shape places, it's just kind of known, okay, C2 allows a 25,000 square foot commercial building and you'll have this much buffer yard and da, 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 da. And everybody knows going in, this is a box that's gonna go there. You may not know exactly what it's gonna be, but you know it's gonna be 25,000 square feet. It'll have a level B buffer yard, blah, 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 blah. And then everybody's come on the, on the same footing. But with that, that also means that once we rezone it, yes, for the most part, we have ceded control. We've said they can do something C2. We just don't know what that something is. So it's, it, that, that's the tension, and it's a fair point. Thanks, Councillor. Chuck, thank you. Uh, can I have a motion to uh, approve item 48? So moved. Second. Second star. Uh, motion by Kylie, seconded by Councillor Starr. You'll get credit for that one, Starr. Um, any further discussion? If not, a roll call vote on this, please. Councilmember Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 49. Item 49 is the second reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located at 2605 and 2609 South Carolyn Avenue from the C4 Commercial Regional District to the I 1 Light Industrial District, petition number 8549 2018. And, excuse me, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval five to zero. Uh, the applicant here is Robert Gales. The owner is Michael Jackson. Uh, it's located at 2605 and 2609 South Carolina Avenue. Uh, that's north of West 41st Street and just east of I-29. Uh, it's roughly 3.08 acres on two parcels. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking at keeping the existing egg and drywall, drywall business on um, 2609 and then they have acquired the old i-29 brick business on the parcel to the north uh, they're looking at constructing an addition 
uh, to that existing building and then utilize both uh, properties for their egg and uh, drywall contractor shop. Great questions for Jason from the council on this. And is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this topic? If not, I'd entertain a motion on this. Move approval. Second. Move approval. Selberg, seconded by Kylie. Any further discussion, Council? If not, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Nightsert? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Next item. Item 50 is a report of the June 15, 2018 Notice of Transfer of Appropriations within Major Organizational Units. We'll move on to new business. Council, is there any additional new business? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor say yes. 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 All opposed, no. That motion is carried. Our meeting is adjourned. Have a great night. It's the 4th of July.